Okay, so this is going to be a different portion of your respiratory disorders um, that we're going to cover for COPD. Um, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So what is COPD? COPD is like a trunk of a diagnostic term. Um, so then branches of this trunk include the emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So these are slightly different. Um, so emphysema is a result from loss of the lung elasticity and a hyperinflation of the lung leading to the dyspnea, reduced gas change, and increased respiratory rate. This increased amount of air that's trapped leads to an increased work of breathing um, from the hyperinflated lungs, um, and that flattens the diaphragm. Um, then this causes the muscles to become weakened after a while, um, kind of give up, and then our accessory muscles try to kick in and try to assist um, because we have that increased need for oxygen and they get this air hunger situation. An increased respiratory rate may lead to no gas exchange problems in an ABG um, until there's an advanced disease problem going on. CO2 retention and chronic respiratory acidosis can be seen though on occasion um, in the chronic state, not in the acute state. So again, advanced disease, then we can see um, more laboratory-wise issues. In the late stages, they may have that low PaO2 due to a difficulty moving um, alveoli um, and the blood oxygen exchange. Usually associated with smoking or chronic exposure to another inhaled particle. Chronic bronchitis, on the other hand, is inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles from irritants, um, especially cigarette smoke. Um, but the irritant causes the inflammation, vasodilation, edema, congestion, bronchospasms, all that cascade. That causes the bronchial walls to thicken and impairs our airway, um, blocking smaller airways and narrowing the larger ones and that becomes a breeding ground for microorganisms to grow and lead to this infection. So it's kind of a result of that process that's going on. Um, the PO2 levels are gonna be decreased and your CO2 levels are gonna increase, um, resulting in respiratory acidosis. So why is COPD a problem? Um, it can be precipitated by the irritants like cigarette smoking and or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So this could be a genetic issue. It's the fourth leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. It affects gas exchange and the oxygenation of all of our tissues. So hypoxemia, acidosis, respiratory infections, cardiac failure, dysrhythmias, and respiratory failure can all come from COPD issues. It interferes with all aspects of the client's life. Just think about them trying to walk down to the mailbox, trying to bend over, sleeping difficulties because they can't sleep when they're laying flat when it's in these severe cases. So it's just, it interferes with every part of their life because you need oxygen for everything, right? So what does this look like? Moderate, mild to moderate, and then severe are gonna be different um, kind of associated symptoms. So we're gonna have some difficulty breathing while talking. They may have to pause during their sentences in order to take those breaths. Some wheezing and coughing can also be seen. They're gonna be sleeping in a semi-sitting position because it's difficult for them to breathe when they're laying down. This is called orthopnea. So these are like um, questions that you'll need to know in order to ask these clients so that they may not realize that this is an issue, but 
are you using more pillows than you're used to? And I think back and like, oh yeah, I used to only use one pillow, but now I've really gotten into the habit of using two pillows. That is a sign that their COPD has worsened. And so different things like these home and lifestyle, how they're talking um, with their having to pause and take those breaths more frequently in the middle of their sentences. They're having problems doing their activities of daily living or sexual activity. You have to ask these questions because they may not report it as an issue. It's kind of like a slow creep up on them. It slowly worsens over time. They have to bring that attention to them to compare a few months ago versus now. Oh yeah, there is kind of a change. I've just been, you know, compensating by doing this instead or using another pillow or sometimes I use a rail or I'll stop walking up the hill and take some breaths whereas I used to not I just thought I was getting overweight well maybe it's not a weight problem maybe it's their COPD worsening um, they can get dyspneic and um, have increase in their mucus production if they're coughing a lot more frequently they're moving slower or um, maybe slightly stooped over trying to breathe it, open that airway the little things that they may not notice that they're doing um, are these symptoms that we're, we're gonna need to be able to ask these questions if they're slightly forward bending in this posture with their arms forward in the orthopnic or tripod position seen in this picture at the top. Um, this can be a sign that they're trying to work to breathe. Um, so they may have mild to moderate COPD and it, they may be having some difficulty. Um, the cyanotic and dusky appearance because of their cyanosis. Um, decreased capillary refill also due to poor perfusion. Um, whereas with severe COPD, these activities are getting harder and our compensation positioning wise is gonna be more exaggerated. Um, so activity intolerance that interferes with their bathing and grooming. They physically cannot take care of themselves every day. They take a bath when they have a good day and they can breathe good. So it may be a change in their routine or their pattern and these things they need to be mindful of. So when they do have these changes in their pattern, sorry, they can stop what they're doing and call their doctor because they need some further interventions. Um, unplanned weight loss related to their increased work of breathing can also be seen. Um, those muscles trying to breathe takes up a lot of their energy, a lot of their effort. And if they're using most of their effort to breathe, it's taking up their metabolic needs. And they're probably not going to be eating much if they're constantly struggling to breathe. So then their caloric intake is not sufficient enough for their increased metabolic demand. So weight loss can be seen in the severe COPD clients. Enlarged neck muscles, again, as they're trying to compensate um, and make uh, that increased work of breathing more effective, straining to breathe. Lung sounds when we listen uh, can be hyper resonant because the trapped air may be inside. So if the one part of the bronchioles has been closed off or trapped, um, that lower part of the airway that still has air in it, it's that trapped air. It can't come out. Um, wheezing and reduced breath sounds as the part of the lung is starting to close up. You know, wheezing is the sound of the turbulence of the air moving through the bronchial. So if it's strained to get out of a tube, it's going to make that wheezy noise. Their barrel chest 
Um, so we saw a little bit like with the asthma, how the AP diameter changes. That's similar here was just um, after so long of a time with that chronic CO2 buildup, their diaphragm is going to try to expand and compensate because of that extra load. They're retaining that CO2 and so it causes their chest to barrel out. They may be pallor and cyanotic and can have some cardiac changes, um, dependent edema. This can lead to heart failure um, and right sided heart failure specifically. An exacerbation of COPD. Um, so this is different on top of their mild to moderate daily activities or severe COPD daily life. Now, if they're having an exacerbation, their respiratory rate's going to spike up. They're trying to breathe even more so. Um, these people are going to be giving up very easily. Their body's already been in this hyper state trying to compensate. That's where they live is in compensation. But you throw in something like a virus or some sort of exacerbation, their body's not going to be able to compensate very long at all. Um, you can see retractions and even a potential asymmetrical chest expansion where one side is inflating more than the other. And that could be due to the trapped air on one side or a pneumothorax, a lung collapse. Um, we'll get into some of those in a little while. That silent chest though indicates that there is a complete airflow obstruction. No air is moving back and forth so you have no breath sounds. So that's the silent chest and this is an emergency. So it could be from that obstruction or the pneumothorax. Um, so living with this, with COPD, I mean, can you imagine? They're gonna feel isolated, um, decreased socialization, like their friends wanna go out and go on walks or go have conversations over dinner table, have fun talking. It may be difficult for them to talk because they're trying so hard to breathe. And so they feel guilty and start to shut in, um, feel isolated because they can't participate because they're struggling to breathe. They don't have time or the ability to socialize with their friends anymore, or at least how they want to. Um, changes in income and insurance coverage can drastically change the outcome and care of these clients. You imagine the medications that these clients are on and then throw in anxiety or fear, creating one of these exacerbations. If they have a panic attack on top of this, they're not gonna last very long. Every little thing is gonna set them into an exacerbation when they live in this compensated point. And so, these frequent the emergency room a lot. So what labs are consistent with these guys? On the ABG, when we obtain one, um, we are going to need to adjust our OT delivery, how much oxygen that we're giving them based off of um, our results. So we'll get that baseline so we know where we are, but we don't really want to keep sticking them if we don't have to for an ABG. So then once we know where they officially are with that uh, definitive arterial blood gas, then we can rely on the pulse oximeter, the finger probe, um, to adjust our oxygen delivery. Chronic respiratory acidosis um, will be seen on that ABG. Um, be, due to the worsening COPD state um, and showing hypoxemia and hypercarbia, so a low O2 and a high CO2. 
um, on the ABG, we may also see metabolic alkalosis um, due to the compensation by the kidneys. So if it goes the opposite direction or they went into an exacerbation because of their metabolic alkalotic stake, um, because their respiratory system tried to kick in to compensate, but they were already compensating. So again, it's just too much for the respiratory system to handle. Um, on a, if we take a sputum, uh, we want to send it for culture in case it's a respiratory infection. It's a very common exacerbation on these guys, especially for the um, like the bronchitis side of it, bronchitis spasms causing the trigger um, and the whole cycle of causing an exacerbation in these guys. Hemoglobin and hematocrit um, are going to be slightly increased, so we call that polycythemia due to a hypoxemic response. So if I don't have enough oxygen, my body's like, hey, my hemoglobin carries my oxygen. Maybe if I throw out some more hemoglobin, I can pick up more oxygen. So that's the kind of response that's going on right here. Um, but then we'll see also like a low phosphate, potassium, calcium, and magnesium levels as a result from the acidotic state that we're in. Chest x-ray is going to show some hyperinflation, again due to that retained CO2, and a flattened diaphragm due to the chronic CO2 um, retention. But we want to still get this chest x-ray to make sure and rule out any other lung diseases or problems that may be occurring, such as like um, a pneumothorax or um, pneumonia. Pulmonary function tests can also be performed um, before and after a treatment of a bronchodilator. This will show us um, how much the bronchodilator has helped and if the residual volume increases, if we see an increase over time or any time during treatment on this PFT, um, we can likely assume that there is trapped air in their lungs. So how are we going to care for these clients? Well, priority wise, our issue that is going on, the main issue is our decreased gas exchange. So we need to intervene on that. Um, and how can we do that? With airway maintenance and with medications. The medications that we're gonna use are the same ones that we're using for asthma our beta adrenergic agents, the cholinergic antagonists, xanthines, corticosteroids, chromones, same ones, as well as long-term control therapy drugs um, like the alphormeterol, indicaterol, titropopium, bromide, allodeterol, and combination drugs like fluconazone and um, bilenterol and then your allodeterol with the tiotropium and um, the last one. <laughs> but um, so similar to what we're doing already with asthma on our step ladder. So these are like severe asthmatics in this kind of treatment mindset. Um, may also wanna consider some systemic agents um, so that it helps with not just directly on the lungs, but systemically with the rest of the body so that it can help decrease the inflammatory response um, could be a potential. And mucolytics um, to break down that mucus, open that airway back up, nebulizer treatments, um, and inhaler uses. Um, airway maintenance though, we're going to need to monitor their breathing techniques um, and how are they breathing? How can I change how they're breathing in order to help them compensate better um, with their positioning? Um, may need to put them in that tripod position. Don't let them lay flat. Um, head of bed elevated, showing them how to cough effectively, oxygen if needed. Um, when they're not in an exacerbation, talk about exercise conditioning. Um, may need some suctioning, um, hydration, use of vibratory 
positive pressure devices. So this is like when you are trying to break up that mucus with vibrations and that way it will pull, you can pull off that mucus better. So assessing their breathing rate, rhythm and depth and are they using any accessory muscles when they're doing this? If they are, then it's more severe. We're on the higher end of acute severity, right? Um, previously, uh, we were thought to be at risk for hypoventilation when we would oxygenate COPD clients due to decreasing that drive to breathe. However, new evidence-based practice is showing that uh, this reluctance to deliver oxygen um, is contributed to ineffective management of hypoxia in these clients. So we should always provide oxygen therapy in order to maintain an O2 sat um, for these clients with hypoxia, but their range is going to be 88 to 92. This is our goal for COPD clients. So we don't want to jam them up to 96 or 98 if they're, you know, already on four liters just to maintain 90. They're fine right where they are. Um, so then we need to maintain the client's level of baseline oxygenation. So an O2 of at least 88, remaining free from cyanosis maintaining a cognitive orientation. So they're awake alert oriented, follow commands, um, demands, and understand conversations. Um, they can cough and clear their own secretions and maintain respiratory rate and rhythm to their activity level. This is our goal, to get them back to their baseline, okay? If treatment and acute exacerbations, um, treatments and interventions are not successful um, and we get to the so severe side of COPD with persistent exacerbations, um, they can be put on a lung transplant list or uh, consider lung reduction surgery. So they remove part of that hyperinflated lung tissue um, and it will increase their activity and tolerance, tolerance, not intolerance, and therefore decrease their need for oxygen therapy. Um, they remove that hyperinflated lung. Remember, if it's blocking any other parts of the air, the lung, therefore we have that trapped air um, that trapped air then um, leads to that hyperinflated barrel chest which cannot be comfortable um, with that intolerance and difficulty breathing on all of that. So if we remove that part of the lung, not just not working, then they could improve all of these but also you just got rid of a trigger for those microorganisms to start growing again and having that chronic bronchitis. Um, if they do undergo these though, um, post-operative care is going to include monitoring for complications and respiratory problems of course and they're going to be on a bronchodilator and mucolytic therapy. Um, education about using the incentive spirometer, definitely. Um, 10 times an hour. So we're increased to just a couple from a couple times an hour, like on the commercials. These guys, very important to reinflate the lung that they still have or the part of the lung that they still have. We need to technically force them to open their lung. Um, they are going to get chest physiotherapy on their first day in a pulmonary reassessment every hour after surgery. So that chest physiotherapy is that percussive in order to break up all of that mucus. Um, 
there's going to be mucus and inflammatory reaction due to the surgery, of course. So we want to make sure that that doesn't now cause a trappage as well. So chest physiotherapy can be quite helpful in COPD clients, especially due to mucus levels. So what education can we do? Um, make sure our clients know how to self-monitor their PEFs um, in order to show that they have a relief of an obstruction um, and evaluate the effectiveness of their drug. So if they're having a little bit of difficulty breathing, quickly just do your PEF before you do your bronchodilator. And then you can do your PEF again a few minutes after your bronchodilator so that they can make sure that it's working and not well, I took my bronchodilator, I'll wait, and I'll wait, and I'll wait, and I'll wait. It'll kick in eventually. Well, the longer you wait and it's not kicking in, it's not helping you, you need to go to the hospital. And so ha having them self-monitor that PEF, I was like, well, they feel a little bit better. But if their PEF didn't show much of a change, it's not enough. They need to come to the hospital and get a... Um, a nebulizer or something, maybe even intubated. That inflammatory response is just becoming too great that their lungs are still not opening. They need assistance. So monitoring that PEF at home is gonna be very key in this case. Preventing weight loss uh, is also gonna be a concern for these clients and that they need to be have education on with um, making sure that they have enough caloric intake for their demands, their oxygen demands. Minimizing anxiety uh, so that they don't hyperventilate um, and cause and trigger a reaction, exacerbation. Um, improving their endurance, trying to slowly increase their activity tolerance and prevent respiratory infection. So making sure they're washing their hands, they could have good cough and etiquette, hygiene, um, and things like that. Wear a mask around others that may have like a little runny nose. Well, it, it's not going to be a, just a little runny nose to you as a COPD client. So you need to be more mindful of even those little things because again, they're living in that already compensated state that any little thing is just gonna tip them over the edge. So they need to be aware of this. Um, and then self-assessment education. How to assess their respiratory status and that they're getting adequate gas exchange. To show them how to do their um, capillary refill, quick and easy. Look in the mirror at your lips, at your gums. You feeling a little confused, having difficulty with words. Um, if you're have, you find yourself having to lean over in order to try and take a breath or breathing multiple times before you can get a sentence out. Those things to keep them mindful of that these could be actual worsening symptoms and that they keep track of this. Um, how to assess their cardiac status for adequate perfusion, like the cap refill. Assessing their nutritional status. Am I losing weight? It's important for them to know, it, measure themselves, weigh themselves, because this deals with their COPD. Not so much about making sure that they're not diabetic, I mean, obese or anything like that, but actually their weight loss could be something that at first they're like, oh yeah, I'm losing weight. It's great. Well, actually, it might not be a great thing. Could be a symptom. Um, and then how do they address adherence and understanding of their illness and treatment? Are there resources that we can help them with? Medicaid, Medicare, things like that. Um, clinics, um, the VA center help them um, with making sure that they adhere to their medication regimen. Because just like with asthmatics, the more exacerbations they have, the worsening outcome they have. COPD is the fourth leading cause of death, remember? And that's 
likely I almost said is and I would believe that it would be directly related to not adhering to medications they're not able to adhere to medications due to many factors and social um, disparities um, I don't have the research so I can't say it is but I'm sure it is definitely one of the contributing factors and um, evaluating their effectiveness of care um, again we need to know their baseline say hey how much oxygen do you wear at home or do you wear oxygen at home they don't wear oxygen at home and right now they're on like two liters that's a difference if they're on oxygen at home at four liters but they come in uh, well I know I need at least four liters not two that's not enough for their baseline so I need to know their baseline first um, and then their worker breathing how can I decrease their worker breathing maintain their airway um, how can I maintain their body weight within 10% of their ideal body weight at least um, maintaining their body weight having good nutrition um, adequate amount of carbs for their increased demand um, monitoring decreasing anxiety triggers and their activity intolerance and avoiding those respiratory infections so what concerns can happen with COPD um, we already kind of talked about some respiratory infections and how that can come about um, as a result from COPD it can also be a trigger but um, with the inflammatory response and everything closing up those microorganisms get stuck and it breeds it right so respiratory infections uh, we're gonna treat by giving them oxygen and antibiotics to stop those organisms um, and then reduce the risk of developing other infections so make sure that they're you know doing good oral hygiene good cough hygiene washing their hands um, also making sure that they're not spreading the infection to anybody else again it could have just been like a little mild cold to their granddaughter that came over and visited but to now to them it has developed into pneumonia bacterial because it got trapped and that microorganism expanded took over out of control and became pneumonia to them but now this is bacterial so then that bacteria on their in their mucus when they cough up and leave the tissue sitting out and their daughter that takes care of them is cleaning up everything now the daughter's got some bacterial infection bacterial bronchitis you may not get to the point of pneumonia on somebody else but think about these transmissions got to be mindful of these education about this um right-sided heart failure can also happen as a result from copd um, when it's as a result from copd specifically this right-sided heart failure is called core pulmonale um, it's just a term again with this you're going to administer oxygen and medications to improve gas exchange but because of the heart failure um we're gonna need to increase their fluids in the right areas so we want more intravascular volume right less dependent extravascular volume so we're going to want some diuretics to get off that excess fluid um, but we might also need to consider some fluids some isotonic uh, fluids to stay in the system and then cardiac dysrhythmias can also occur with these clients um and then our interventions are going to be based off of the cause so did their dysrhythmia come up because they were hypoxic well then i'll treat the oxygen if their dysrhythmia came up from a drug effect like the bronchodilators can increase their heart rate and they get a dysrhythmia well then i need to change the drugs that i'm using and monitor it in the meantime 
until it wears off. Um, or if it's from the acidosis, then I need to correct the acidosis, maybe give some bicarb or fluids. Um, so our treatment then on these complications or concerns are going to be based off of what's going on. So this is the conclusion of this portion of your respiratory lecture for COPD. Make sure that you still take a listen to the asthma, uh, pneumonia and the influenza lectures. Thank you.